Welcome. My name's Below Tool, and I'm going to be talking about uh, advanced risk tools and events and festivals. Uh, this is the application of the ISO 31010, 31010, to event management and events. Uh, the events now know about ISO 31000, but there's actually a very good one that could easily be used for events. It's out there and it's available, as you can see. So let's start. This is in a number of parts because there's quite a lot of tools. And I'm just explaining these tools because they're not being used much in events that I know of. Uh, and they could be. Uh, they're there. People know about them. But uh, applying them to events could be a little bit difficult if you're not familiar with them. Basically, I started with a thing called the maturity model, this table here uh, a number of years ago, and I've been using it for many years, and it's worked very well. The reason I know about it is that I followed the events sector coming from uh, the ad hoc period all the way through to where we're up now, which is quality and risk standards. Uh, countries are in various phases. These are five different phases. They must travel through these phases. That's just inevitable. It has to do with internal contradictions, etc. And uh, where a lot of countries are up uh, in Europe, for example, is this quality and risk standards where they're using ISO 31000. Well, the next thing is really to have a look at ISO 31010 and to look at risk management in terms of decision making, not just in terms of safety and compliance. So that's what I'll be explaining. Before I do that, I just want to give a, a plug for this book by uh, Anthony Cox, fabulous book. It's not easy to read, by the way. However, uh, if you are interested in it, uh, the main thing that he makes, which is very good, is the split between sort of engineering risk analysis, and you'll come across this quite a lot, and what he calls concern-driven risk analysis. In one case, it's all about probability. In the second case, it's about what's called the precautionary principle. Now, you've seen that with regard to uh, COVID, uh, and it had to do with the enormous uncertainty that everybody had about these diseases, these new diseases that no one really knew about. Now, so what you've got to do is once you understand the, uh, the difference between these two, it enables you to do a lot more with risk management and to understand people's opinions, because don't forget, ultimately risk get for events gets down to people. All events uh, use a disk, uh, this graph or this process. Uh, it looks formal. If you're not familiar with it, you should be because if you're doing events and this is really what you you will be using, it's uh, uh, the one called up in courts of law. So you better find out about it. <laughs> it's straightforward once you understand it. Uh, of course, it's a flow chart. So you've sort of got to get used to that type of thinking. Uh, and you'll find it in ISO 31000, okay, as the basis of risk management. You go to any risk book, you'll find this diagram. So just to give you a bit of a scare, uh, <laughs> these are the tools and techniques, the advanced tools and techniques that are used in risk uh, analysis and risk management, risk assessment. Now, you can use these for events. That's my point here. Uh, there's no need to be scared by all these names and the technical nature of it. A lot of it comes from engineering, hence the technical side of it. But for you, you can actually use them. They are, and in fact, in a lot of cases, you do already use them, but you don't know about them. And these are the things we'll be going through. Okay. In uh, in the standard, you'll actually find them explained, but <laughs> it won't necessarily make you any the wiser, uh, because really what you need is how they apply to events. How do you apply Markov analysis uh, to events? Um, and it really doesn't tell you there, but I will. Okay. And there's more, and there's more. So I definitely recommend you get the ISO uh, 31010, however they decide to call it, uh, and uh, just to make sure that's part of your library for events. And uh, by watching these videos, there'll be a few of them. They'll only be about 10 minutes each. Uh, uh, you should be able to go through it and be able to apply these. So before we do that, uh, and one of the 
problems is that logic isn't really taught now. Um, and it's very important to the basis of risk management is obviously logic. So we'll just go through a little bit of logic. The There's basically two areas that you need to know about. One's called inductive reasoning, where you go from a specific example to come up with a general law, and deductive reason, where you go from a general law to a specific example in front of you. Now, you know about deductive reasoning if you've ever watched a detective series or uh, Sherlock Holmes. They deduce things all the time. I'm going to use the great Nassim Taleb's example for this because it's a good one. And anyway, I rec absolutely recommend that you read the book. Uh, as it says there, it's mind-blowing. <laughs> he tends to jump around a lot, but that's how he thinks. And certainly that's how you have to think in a lot of cases when it comes to innovation uh, and uh, events, coming up with new ideas, etc. So it's a good one. So firstly, just to use his example, we're going to do inductive reasoning. Now, if you lived in Europe for a thousand years and uh, you were describing uh, a swan to, per, uh, to a person, you know, a new swans, uh, the person would immediately assume that they are white. Why? Because the only swans that people had seen were white swans. And so they went from specific, i.e., I see lots of white swans, to a general rule. All swans are white. Now, this goes for a lot of things, obviously not just swans. I'm just using the one because Taleb does. Okay, the, <clears throat> so then there's deductive reason. Now, once you've got a general rule, all swans are white, you see a swan in front of you, you say, must be white. Okay, now you use deductive reasoning all the time, you know, about if you have a for example, I've got a pen in my hand now. If I if I let go of the pen, it falls to the earth, right? Uh, and we say it's following the law of gravity. Okay, so the law of gravity is a general rule, and therefore uh, it affects the pen and which way it's going to go. So it's able to predict. Remember, all this risk management is about predictions. Okay, so that's deductive, going from a general to a specific, and you do that all the time. Think about crossing the road. Okay, you use inductive reasoning. What do I mean? It means that you don't cross every road in the world <laughs> to be able to find out whether you can cross the road outside your house. Right? You're using inductive reasoning. You've crossed enough roads, therefore you've got a general rule for yourself for how you act to cross a road. Now, uh, that's all very good, but in, in the reality, in the big red world, there are things that uh, NASM calls black swans, and these are surprising events that completely disprove the general law. Uh, in this case, when they came to Australia, they found black swans, which they couldn't even believe existed because they were so sure that all swans were white. The same went for a lot of animals here. And if you know anything about it, it means they went over the Wallace line, the famous Wallace line. So in a sense, you have what's called bounded rationality. That means your how you reason, how you come up with things. And remember, this is risk management. So you're trying to predict what can go wrong. How you come up with things is based on your culture and your experience. That's where you get your general rules for, which you apply to the next event. That's why we're doing the logic bit. So normally in uh, engineering risk analysis, uh, remember that one at the top there, it had to do with likelihood analysis. It's also called probability estimation. You're having a look at how frequency an incident happens, and then you're saying our event is very similar to that sort of event. Therefore, this is how frequent there will be. A good example would be drugs at events. Okay, uh, If you're doing music events, there's a certain likelihood that there will be drug problems there. And of course, this is how first aid medical people sort out what sort of resources they need at an event. They work out what uh, various things. We'll go into it later on, actually. Another good example is feet injury at Sculpture by the Sea. We have a sculpture show here um, uh, where I live, and it is by the sea near the rocks and everything. And uh, because people keep on looking at the sculptures and not watching where they're walking, the most common injury, and I ask them, 
uh, is feet injury, you know, stubbing their toes. Okay, so that's likelihood analysis and probability estimation. Now, that's good. That's fine. That's fine for quite a lot of things and a lot of people. That's all they think about. But you've got to remember your event is unique. You're going to have unique events. You're going to have things that you have never thought about. So you need different perspectives on something. There's a variety of things that stop you able to think outside your own culture, your own sphere, your own bounded rationality. So, for example, if something has never happened before, you have no frequency analysis or probability estimation of if it's going to happen or not. Okay, and a good example is when drones started. When they started to have drones, you know, what's the frequency of injury from drones? Well, nobody knew because there was something new. And, of course, they were taken on by events very quickly. So, basically... <clears throat> There's a lot of things that restrict your ability to think through things, in other words, to predict things for an event. One of them is called silent evidence. Okay, It means that just because there's no evidence for something in the past doesn't mean it won't happen. They could have just not actually recorded things. Okay, Absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, to quote Massim again. I, so, for example... Um, in, in if if people aren't collecting safety information from events, which they haven't done in countries in the past, it doesn't mean their events are more safe. <laughs> it just means they haven't been collecting anything. And that means silent evidence. And uh, that, of course, uh, leads into what's called confirmation bias. And this is the last one. And it's basically a bias that you will have because of who you are, what you are, and you can't get away from it the, the, in terms of yourself, except by having a variety variety of experience. Get out there and experience the world. People sometimes get very safe in their, in their jobs and their life and everything, and then when they uh, are confronted by something that's new, which is what events are, don't forget, um, then they can't actually think through it. And that's why you have people from a variety of experiences coming to your risk management meetings, and they must be able to say what they're talking, uh, at, at any risks that they see. We'll go on to that later on when we talk about risk management meetings and how to run them. Okay, but remember that you will only see things that confirm, confirm your current thinking. So you have to be careful of that. So what we've just gone through there is just the logic, the inductive logic, deductive logic, and then the catastrophe, because people think they already know and they absolutely don't. Then the limitations of frequency analysis and bias. Uh, in the next part, we'll talk about... Um, what next? <laughs> uh, we'll talk about causal analysis, bow tie analysis, and sensitivity, and all of which I'll give you with plenty of examples in events so that you can use it. Okay, so that's the end. You're welcome to email me or go to my website. The email's there. If you've got any comments, please leave them below. Thank you very much.